Morning, everybody. Really good to see you. And I can just about actually see folks who are sitting away at the back. Thank you for being with us for this continued series on the life of Christ called Messiah. We are working our way through the gospel according to Matthew. And we've come this week to Matthew chapter 15. So if you'd like to hunt that up, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 20, we're going to read. But before we do, let me just introduce it by saying this. There are some things about the Christian faith that are so out of step with culture that people find them really difficult to get their heads around. They are real stumbling blocks uh, to faith, to belief. Now, I'm not talking about the behavior of some Christians, some professing Christians, or the behavior of some churches and the, the weird things that Christians can get up to. I'm talking about things that are at the heart of the Christian message itself. We need to face this, that there are some things that have always been and will always be out of step with our culture. And we came across one of those uh, a few weeks ago at the end of Matthew chapter 13, where the people of Jesus' own hometown were stumbled by the evidence of Jesus' miraculous powers and his teaching. And they just couldn't get their heads around it. Isn't this the carpenter's son? We know him. He was at school here. <laughs> What's going on? And they, they just couldn't get their heads around this supernatural dimension. How could that be possible? They had the evidence, but they weren't prepared to follow where the evidence led. And therefore, Matthew tells us, they stumbled or they were offended. They were scandalized, in fact, by him. Now, today we're going to meet another one of these things that is at the heart of Christianity but it really offends people. It causes them to stumble. So let's read Matthew 15, verses 1 to 20. Then some Pharisees, the Pharisees were a sect within Judaism, very strict, very religious, and scribes or teachers of the law. They came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders they don't wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus replied, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father and mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And Jesus then called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? They were scandalized, stumbled. He replied, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. That's a great 
story, really interesting story. Matthew tells us at the beginning that these religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, had come up from Jerusalem. In other words, it was an official delegation from religious HQ. And we have met these men already in chapter 12, where they clashed with Jesus over the Sabbath observance, how to keep the Sabbath, and they came out of it badly, exposed for their hypocrisy and their ignorance of what the Bible actually said. But rather than admit it, they doubled down and began to plot how they might have Jesus killed. So this visit was part of building a case against Jesus. So they go straight in with their question, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, I suppose it would seem a strange thing to argue over uh, washing hands before you eat, because we all know it's a good thing to do, wash your hands before eating. But this wasn't a dispute about hygiene. The Pharisees washed their hands before eating their food as a religious rule. It was a religious tradition that they had developed and refined over the years. For example, perhaps they'd been out in the supermarket, in the marketplace, buying stuff, handling money that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, had also touched. And that, of course, then made the money unclean because non-Jews had touched it. And that, so if they had touched it or shaken somebody's hand or touched their clothing or whatever, that made them, they thought, unclean. So they would come with great ceremony and before they ate the food, they would elaborately wash their hands. And there's a whole description of what went into washing their hands before they ate so that they would not be ceremonially defiled. Now you've got to ask where they got the idea from. There are some references in the Bible, in the Old Testament, as we call it, in the law of Moses, to hand washing. For example, in Exodus chapter 30, the priests had to wash their hands and indeed their feet at the laver in the tabernacle before they served in the tabernacle. It was a, a symbolic gesture to emphasize the importance of personal holiness. But down through the years, these elders, the Pharisees, had added to this, had taken that idea, developed it. They had piled up regulation after regulation. They applied it to all kinds of situations not mentioned in the Bible, and not just in the area of hand washing. In total, there were 614 religious rules that people had to keep. True religion, therefore, became very much a matter of keeping rules and keeping traditions. Now, at the time Matthew was writing, most of these rules hadn't yet been written down. They were part just of their strong oral tradition, but they were eventually written down and became what is known as the Talmud, all 35 volumes of it, containing the traditions and the interpretation of the elders and the teachers. And indeed, to this day, Jewish authorities ascribe to the Talmud far more authority than they ascribe to their scriptures. So Jesus responded to their question with a question of his own. Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? So note the issue. The tradition of the elders versus God's commands. Tradition, God's word. Indeed, Jesus doesn't even attempt to answer their question, because that was a question about their own traditions, and he was going to get involved in that. That was up to them. His focus was on what God said, not on arguments about traditions which weren't actually in the Bible. But what Jesus picked up on was how that very often the traditions that they had developed in the end contradicted God's word. With the result, as Jesus puts it, they nullified God's word. 
Nullified means to reduce to nothing, empty it out of its meaning and authority and significance, make it a, a nothing, make it void. So these people who were claiming to be scrupulous about God's law, in fact, had substituted their own traditions for God's word. Traditions which in some instances led to outright disobedience to what God had said. So when God said something, they said something different. So again, this is the issue. What God says, what human beings say. They weren't teaching God's word. They were teaching their own religious rules and devices, not simply as an alternative. Well, here's what God said. Here's our tradition. You know, choose either one. That's fine. They'd gone further than that. They were imposing their tradition, which meant that people disobeyed God's word. Their traditions took precedence. As an example, Jesus cites the commandment that we are to honor our parents. I hope grandparents are also included in this. Um, now, what does that command mean? To honor your parents. The command didn't simply mean saying nice things about your parents. It wasn't about lip service. Obeying the command involved practical care providing for the needs of the uh, older generation in their old age, which was very important, especially at that time when pension schemes and social security were far in the future. God's word was clear. The responsibility of children, when they had the means, was to support their parents in their old age. That's what God said. However, these religious leaders were teaching that if the children decided to take the money they were going to devote to the care of their parents and devote it instead to God, in other words, give it into the treasury of the temple, that was perfectly acceptable. They could simply tell their parents that they had pronounced the money korban, devoted to God, offered to God. In other words, under the guise of religion, the Pharisees were saying that children were no longer duty-bound to support their parents. Now, Jesus didn't mince his words. He called them hypocrites, play actors, and quoted their own prophet Isaiah against them. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Now, as I move on, could I ask someone at the back to bring me a glass of water? Because I can hardly speak. I am so dry. I apologize for that. I normally have a full bottle of whiskey before I, I do any <laughs> teaching, um, but uh, just can't quite manage it today. So if somebody could do that, that would be great uh, without distraction. And I promise there's nothing in it, kids, just in case you're wondering whether there's any additives going in. So they were teaching people to treat God the same way they were teaching children to honor their parents. Lip service for God was all that was required. You are a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh no, I've seen you up here before. <laughs> I didn't realize it was so warm in here. I apologize. A wonderful vintage. Now, so lip service then was all that was required. At heart, they were far from God. In their worship services, they kept the same fine words. They used the magnificent language of the scriptures. They sang the sounds. Everything was the same as always but it was empty because of their teaching. Please notice that. Just because people sing wonderful stuff and say wonderful things in their prayer, you need to look at what they actually believed. What did they teach? What did they practice? Their teaching consisted in human rules and traditions, not God's word. 
And Jesus denounced it in the strongest possible terms. Why? Well, because they were misrepresenting God. You notice that Jesus refers to God as my heavenly Father. This is the Father's Son speaking in defense of his Father's character and his Father's word. He took it deeply seriously. The Bible teaches that everything takes second place to God. We put God first above family, self, career. But once we do that, one of the first things God will say to us is look after your parents. So to take God's word concerning parents and pervert it in the name of religion is a complete and serious misrepresentation of God. What impression of God would it give when the Pharisees taught that it was perfectly acceptable to say to aging parents, sorry, but the money that I could have used to look after you, I've given to the temple. What kind of God were they worshiping? Jesus took it seriously. And by quoting Isaiah, who had written hundreds of years before, he was tapping into something that happens not just then, but before. It, it goes on all the time. A major danger, lip service in worship when our hearts are far from God, when what we actually believe and practice is not in accordance with God's word and therefore misrepresents him. Once we depart from what God says and substitute human ideas and traditions, we end up misrepresenting God, whatever fine words we use in our worship services. And then Jesus addressed the issue of what makes a person unclean, what defiles a person. And we notice what happened. He's spoken to the Pharisees. He now speaks to the crowd. Then he speaks to the disciples. And then he speaks to Peter. That careful order in which he addresses the issues he's dealing with. To the crowd, he says, listen and understand what goes into a person's mouth, i.e. food, doesn't defile a person. It is what comes out of their mouth that makes a person unclean. That is, of course, their words, which represent their thoughts, the deepest thoughts of their heart. Defilement comes from inside not from without. He said that to the crowd. It would at least get them thinking. It would get people thinking today. It would offend a lot of people who simply don't agree with this, that the problems of humanity are all external. It's all in the environment. It's all in the education system. It's all in whatever is not working. But it's not in here. That's why political systems always fail because none of them deals with the basic problem of the human heart, the greed, the jealousy, the anger, the lust, the adultery, the sexual immorality, and all of that. Jesus is getting to the core of the issue, and he just puts it in a general word to the crowd to get them to think. But then the disciples came privately to him. Don't you realize the Pharisees were offended by what he said? Stumbled. They were scandalized. The disciples were really concern, possibly even fearful, because they had always looked up to these Pharisees as their leaders, as their teachers, as their guides and the scribes. They'd looked up to them all their life. What was Jesus doing offending them like this? Couldn't he soften his approach a little so that these highly respected official clerics wouldn't be so angry? So Jesus replied, we mustn't offend anybody. Well, he didn't, did he? He said, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Jesus didn't apologize for the strength of his response. The issues at stake were too serious for that. These men were the leaders, supposedly the spiritual guides 
the spiritual destinies and lives and direction of people was at stake. They claimed to represent God. But, says Jesus, my heavenly Father didn't plant them. They're not from him. And one of these days, they will be dealt with like a gardener deals with weeds. Pull them up by the roots. So, leave them. Strong stuff. Don't follow leaders like that because they are spiritually blind. They are headed for disaster. And if you follow them, you follow them into disaster. How would you know if your leaders are blind guides? It's a good question, isn't it? It's one we all need to ask. And the answer from this passage is very clear. You know it if they teach the opposite of what God has said. If they teach their own traditions and ideas as God's word. We are to learn to assess leaders on this. To what extent do they remain faithful to what God has clearly said? And then to be prepared to leave them if they are not sticking to God's word. See, Jesus was preparing his disciples for what lay ahead of them in a few months. Jesus would be rejected by the same religious authorities and crucified. God would raise him from the dead. Jesus would then commission his disciples to go and preach the gospel of forgiveness in his name to the whole world. Now the authorities, the religious authorities in Jerusalem didn't mind the early Christians doing lots of good works for the poor, but they did mind any reference to Jesus, any teaching that Jesus was the true Messiah. And very soon in the life of the early church, the Sanhedrin, the supreme authority within Judaism, banned them, or at least attempted to ban them from preaching or doing anything in the name of the Lord Jesus. So what would they do? I mean, they were just humble fishermen, probably with a very rudimentary education, faced with these learned professors and clerics and experts in the law. Should they bow to them or not? They had to decide what they were going to do. I can just imagine one of them saying, well, I'm not a theologian. I mean, I, I, I can't get my head around all this, this argument of complexity, but so-and-so has been to Oxford or Cambridge, and they have all these degrees and all this knowledge, and I mean, they must know what they're doing, and I'm just a humble whatever. What would you decide? What would they decide? It wasn't a matter of unnecessarily stirring up religious conflict. It was a basic question of authority of whose voice would they listen to and then take the consequences as they came. Or as Peter would put it to the Sanhedrin, you judge for yourselves. Is it better to obey God or man? Which is it? I mean, it was a straightforward choice, just the same choice that Jesus is talking about here. And then in this passage, Peter spoke up. I do like this, because he didn't still understand the parable. He was still back there. And what comes, goes into the mouth, not defiling the person, but what comes out. And I just love the honesty. I also uh, I admire Christ's directness. Are you still so dull? <laughs> I used to be a teacher, uh, and occasionally you felt like saying such things, but maybe um, in these days, particularly a political correctness, you need to be quite careful. But Jesus knew Peter. Peter knew, and Peter, what would work with him? Peter, wake up some. Oh, you, st you still not see this? And then explained it. It's not what goes through your, into a person's mouth. It's nothing to do with being clean in the sight of God. The cause of spiritual uncleanness must itself be spiritual, not physical. 
It's out of the heart, he said, that come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. These, this list, this ugly brood of things, they are all symptoms of universal heart disease. We don't all have the symptoms in equal measure, but we all have the disease. The Bible ter term for it is sin. And it manifests itself in all kinds of ways. This is what defiles a person. What comes from in here? Not washing your hands has nothing to do with being spiritually unclean. There's a difference between germs and sin. And of course, it follows that washing your hands before eating doesn't deal with the condition of the human heart. How could it? How could physical water applied on the outside deal with a spiritual disease on the inside? There is no external right, no religious ritual, no religious washing that can affect spiritual cleansing. The Pharisees were just beside themselves with anger. They were scandalized, offended by Jesus' exposure of what Jesus called lip service, calling their worship of God lip service, honoring God with fine words, but replacing God's own word with their tradition. And that's still a scandal. And it brings us back to this as I draw towards the end. The big stumbling block for so many people is this, that we love our own ideas. We love our own opinions. We love our own traditions. There's some traditions we don't like, so we get rid of them and, and create our own. But it comes down to this. We love our own ideas. Jesus insists on the supremacy of God's ideas. God's word or our word, which is it? And that's the basic question that each of us has to answer in life. Whose voice do I listen to? We've been pretty tough on the Pharisees so far. They're the ones in the story. But we can look closer to home. We can look at the professing Christian church and ask ourselves, does the church ever produce traditions that go against God's word? There's a great topic for discussion over lunch. According to God's word, for example, Christ offered himself as the one sacrifice for sin forever sat down on the right hand of God, as a result, according to the Bible, there is no longer any sacrificing. That's all done and dusted. It's been ended. That once for all sacrifice secured forgiveness, rendering any further sacrificing for sin unnecessary. And yet, in the church over the years, traditions gradually arose that saw in what the New Testament calls the Lord's Supper a sacrifice, taking bread and wine. And instead of it being a remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ, it actually became a sacrifice that we still have to offer on an altar, would you believe, to gain forgiveness. God's Word says one thing, church tradition says another. Which are you going to go with? Now, that's an ancient tradition, hundreds of years. What about today? Well, consider the hot topics of gender and marriage. The Bible is consistent on this from beginning to end. God created two genders, male and female. Marriage is the exclusive union of one man with one woman. But now new traditions, new religious rules have already been established in a number of church denominations, are being pushed in others. 
most notably the Anglican Church, that redefine marriage, that redefine what a woman is, that tell people they may have been born in the wrong body. Now, these are all complex and emotive issues. No one ever loved people like Jesus did. But in his loving compassion for the human race, he insisted that marriage is a heterosexual union. So you'll have to decide. You've got what God says, and then you've got developing human tradition. And you've got to decide which voice do you listen to. And it isn't going to be easy because there's enormous pressure socially, emotionally, politically, in the media, and also through the legal system. Because Jesus is totally out of step with culture when it comes to this issue. So you have to decide. Am I prepared to be, follow Jesus and be out of step with culture? Or be out of step with God and go with culture and change a few things in the Bible that don't fit? Is that what I'm prepared to do? The problem is that many people in the church don't actually know what the Bible teaches on these issues, hasn't looked at it seriously enough. And many, particularly amongst the young, have secretly decided, if not openly, that they accept the LGBT ideology. So it's going to take a great deal of courage and faith and hard work to go against the flow, to remain loyal to God's word rather than to human ideology and the revised religious rule. It's going to take great courage to assess our leaders, those who claim to be Bible teachers and spiritual guides in the church according to the extent to which they teach God's word. And great courage to leave those who have substituted their own ideas for what God says. Great courage, not just to worship God with our lips, but also with our heart and lives submitted to his voice. So this is a, a challenge, and it leaves all of us with that challenge. What way am I going to go? Is it God's voice or my voice, the voice of culture, the voice of certain leaders in the church and theologians in the church who have decided that what God said was okay for them, but it isn't for now and we're going to change it. These are complex issues. I don't want to trivialize them. I want to do simply what Jesus did. Rather than discussing the various traditions and ideologies, to go to the heart of it and say, is it what God says? or what somebody else says. That's the fundamental underlying issue. Plenty to chat about over lunch. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your courage and clarity. In a confused world, to stand and expose the real issue the authority of God's word or the authority of human tradition and ideas. We want to take it seriously. We want to examine for ourselves and see and decide. And I pray that you'd give each of us courage in our own small way with graciousness, kindness, compassion, love to stick loyally to what you say. To be like Peter and the others, not ignorantly, but to stand quietly and say, we have a Lord. We're not free just to do what everybody wants us to do. Our loyalty is to Jesus who died and rose again. And we stand with him. If you're going to punish us for that, if you're going to laugh at us for that, if you're going to mock and persecute us for that, so be it. 
but we're not going to bow down. We're going to stand loyally to the one who loved us and died for us. Show each of us, we pray, in our lives what that means so that our worship is meaningful and not empty, not lip service, saying fine things about God and then going and doing something completely different. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.